am just so humble to be on the stage with these amazing artists, um, some of the globe's finest, and uh, really uh, it's special to me because I feel like we share a focus on really lifting up the voices of those marginalized and, and really revealing our humanity. Um, I want to um, uh, first introduce them before we get into our conversation about uh, this question of must artists be activists. I got to know Suzanne Lacey uh, probably about 15 years ago when she was leading the public practice program at Otis College. Um, I found her to be an amazing inspiration as I was developing LA Commons, um, a uh, you know, master in the art of social practice and performance art, having written books, including Mapping the Terrain, New Genre Public Art, and Leaving Art, Writings on Performance, Politics, and Publics. She is now a professor at the Roski School of Art and Design at USC and in residence uh, at 18th Street Art Complex and brings her special brand of art and what I like to say uh, activating citizenship um, to cities around the globe. I just got to meet uh, Catherine Opie uh, in preparing for this panel, having been familiar with her work for many years, seeing it again in preparation, I was my breath was taken away at her ability to reveal uh, the deepness, the diversity of our humanity. Um, she, like uh, Suzanne Lacey, is a educator as well. Um, and you know, one of the things I am amazed at with these women who have, you know, this these amazing art practices also have time to lead art departments and educational institutions. She was the chair of the art and architecture faculty at UCLA, in addition to being this extraordinary photographer, filmmaker. Uh, collages ceramicist and being lauded in, in many ways as a Guggenheim Fellow in 2019 and in residence uh, at the American, American Academy in Rome uh, under the auspices of the Robert Michelthorpe residency. Um, and of course, she's been shown as Suzanne all over the world and um, recognized for her uh, incredible artistry. So just to get us started, I, you know, I don't, I mean, I might be stating the obvious, but this really is one of the most challenging times that I can uh, remember in my lifetime. Um, and I'm sure you all will agree with that. Um, uh, the, um, it's challenging, but, you know, as, as our speakers uh, previously have said, it's not unprecedented. What is unprecedented is the myriad ways that people have to communicate and the tools, the sophisticated tools in which people can construct narratives. Um, in addition, we have structures, old structures that are, um, dare I say, crumbling because you know, things are shifting. Society is transforming, and these structures are not serving us. These institutions are not serving us. And that could be a good thing in many ways because the structures have been exclusive uh, to, to a large extent. Uh, people of color have been left out, um, and the opportunities that are opening up across uh, you know, our diverse humanity uh, is increasing, but it's still very complicated to, to um, be an artist in this day and age. And so our question, must artists be activists? There, there are a couple of terms there that we really need to define, and one of them is, 
what is an artist in 2023? And then also, what does it mean to be an activist? Very broad, uh, you know, uh, wide span of, of being in terms of this idea of activist. To answer those questions, I think our great opportunity is to hear from these wonderful artists. So what I'd like to do to start is just to have you talk about your work. Um, so let me start with Suzanne, and then we'll hear from Kathy. Well, I think when Kathy and I met over the phone, uh, I mean over Zoom, uh, we made short, uh, short work of the title. Both of us said, no, artists don't have to be activists. And then we started, and that started me on a sort of trajectory of thinking about was I an activist? What does that mean uh, nowadays? What does it mean to my students that are very is very different than certainly what it meant to me in the 70s? Um, and and I, I, I want to read you the definition of an activist, just in case uh, you don't know this. A doctrine or practice that emphasizes direct, vigorous action, especially in support of or opposition to one side of a controversial issue. So immediately what, what sort of came to me was some of these words like direct, um, acting, opposition, one side or the other. And uh, that helped me a lot in thinking about my practice. I've done some of that kind of work, certainly in Mourning and in Rage, um, a project in 77 with Leslie Labowitz. It looked like a protest. It was a protest. It was on the steps of City Hall. We had direct policy goals in mind. We wanted the, the phone company to put a rape hotline in their emergency listings, which they didn't at that time. We brought city council people out to be part of the project. So that really is what I would call an activist work. Um, in Oakland, I worked with teenagers for 10 years to challenge the various institutions, whether it be police, most significantly police, but education and healthcare, to challenge the systems that were not nurturing young people and to give young people a public voice. And there was a direct policy implication to that, trying to get a, um, a youth policy passed, which we did. And then recently in Ecuador, De Tupunye Letra, which was a project with 300 men in the middle of a bull ring reading letters that women had written on domestic violence. And that was a partnership with the city of Ecuador, uh, excuse me, the city of Quito, the mayor's office. So those projects, I would say, fall into the um, direct activism kind of strategy. But I don't think that's the center of gravity of my work. I think I'm much more interested in negotiative strategies, in um, the educational strategies, and in coming together, which makes, um, and, and working out difference, which makes situations like today in this panel slightly problematic when people are asked to have a position now on a subject. So I think that that would, would characterize, and I can talk later about some of the other works. Great. Kathy? Um, I, I, I mean, it was interesting because we did talk about it, and I was thinking a lot about what an activist is. And I was thinking about my different kind of positions in relationship to that in my life and what it also means to bear witness with a camera. And I think that at times when I don't have a camera on me and I'm at a march, there is a moment that maybe I'm an activist. But whenever I have a camera on me, I'm no longer that same kind of activist because I'm bearing witness and I'm really looking at the world from, the own, from my own questions, actually, that I'm trying to answer in relationship to a larger humanity. And how do we get to it? And is there any way to get through it through, by creating visual representations? And so the, the activist in me is... It's, it's a dichotomy in the same way of many dichotomies that we inhabit in our lives and our relationship to our own politic. And I think that um, the ever-shifting politics, especially in relationship to this country and 
being born in 1961 and being in a country that has never been, in my lifetime, not a part of conflict. Um, makes me also very aware of my relationship in another term that was very important that Suzanne uh, said just a moment ago, and that's citizenship. And so in relationship to this idea of authoritative uh, notions and, and kind of nationalism at its utmost rise, my question is, is then what is my responsibility in taking care? And what is my responsibility as an individual to humanity and to understanding that and trying to create representations in relationship to those ideas? Well, I think, I think that's um, actually a distinction that I make quite easily. I'm a citizen on this side and I'm an artist on this side. So oddly, I do separate them and I do participate in direct protest and voting and you know um, uh, uh, all kinds of de democratic processes as a citizen. But as an artist, I've over the years really, I mean, art is visual art we're talking about. You want to know what is an artist. Um, I have a very specific idea about that. There are varieties of artistic creative practice, but I address the visual arts world of people who've been educated, want to be educated, want to address that world. My audiences are quite broad and diverse, but my community of address for me is a visual artist. And my career has been based on how do you change visual art mm -hmm. to make it possible for activism, for various forms, for different constituencies, for different practitioners to emerge into the, um, you know, the, the environment of professional visual arts, which is kind of finally happening. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I, you know, when I argued with you about what act, we're, yeah, we're, we're here too. <laughs> when, when, I, when I was kind of talking to you on the phone about like being like, well, you're more of an activist than I am. It's because of that community engagement that you literally do in relationship to your practice. My community engagement is very different and very kind of almost private to a certain extent. But yet my teaching would be the other side of, of the coin for me in, in, in terms of but I think I think that's also what we happen to be good at. Like social practice is not for everybody. Photography is not for everybody. And for me, I probably couldn't make a decent photograph if I tried to. Occasionally I do. But, but what, I'm, what I'm good at is how people operate in time and space and, and, and I bring my sort of moral positions about listening and diversity and the importance of learning that happens for me in the middle of a, of a process. So, you know, when we began this conversation on, on Zoom, I was like, well, I can't talk without showing video, you know, because when I, when I lecture, I show the, the voices of the people with whom I work. You know, my work is about choreography in, in relationality in public. So um, I think that, that it, it's, that's simply something I know how to do. And it makes, for me, the question, the thing that we share, which is we come into it with questions. We come into it with personal ethics. And I think in some cases, we, at least me, I come into it with a sense of utopia. What would it, like Gomez Pena was talking about, what would it look like if during the course of this performance, people actually talk to each other? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you're, um, I mean, you know, I am so appreciative of this exchange and really understanding where you're coming from as artists and as activists. But you're also educators and you're also, you know, cultivating this next generation of artists, perhaps activists, you know, what are the challenges because of this environment that we're living in where, you know, we talked about, you know, just, and I think I looked at something with you, Kathy, where you were talking about just images, images, images. How do we cultivate effective, you know, artists if we want to be there? Mm -hmm. The, that is a really hard question right now with what's the times that we're holding in the world. And I think that it's almost a question 
that can't really be answered, to be honest, because it, because it is really about, again, that kind of relationship of collectivity and whether or not collectivity is actually something that is on the minds of, of the powers to be is another really uh, highly important thing to be examining. And because of that, there isn't enough ability for true, honest communication at this moment in time often. And so I'm finding it very difficult to hold the times as an artist that we're living in and I'm finding them increasingly hard to have larger, broader conversations without paring it down to more kind of simplistic notions of form that can be recognized from multiple kind of perspectives. And that is my You're strategy talking about right with now. your students? Hmm? Not about with your students? Well, I think even with my own work, like when I with with looking at the Catholic Church and doing that last body of work, walls, windows, and blood, it is about the kind of architecture within the Vatican as hypocrisy in relationship to the doctrine of the Catholic Church. So within that, you distill it down to again this other kind of notion of a holy trinity, but it's walls, windows, and blood. And does that open up a broader conversation because you kind of make it, I, I don't know, you, you, try to, you try to make it more open-ended, I suppose. I think that in my earlier work, they were much more statements. And I would say that my statements are less, and it's more about observation in a weird way. You know, obviously, uh, oddly, that's kind of similar for me, that, uh, you know, on violence against women, I could be kind of like, Stop violence against women. Stop the way you cover the media. But but in my later work, I've become a lot more engaged with nuances and subtleties of relationality. In a project I did in uh, Northwest England, in a deindustrialized area, um, the, the the Pakistani Muslims and the white Christians used to work together in the mills and. After the mills were closed and the textile industry moved on, the region not only became impoverished, but it came quite separated and almost hostile to each other. And so the whole project was around, over two years, was around bringing Pakistani immigrants who had formerly worked in mills and white Christians and having conversations on racism. And But in the end, the best part of the project was something that was simply a sonic film. And it really opens the affective channels toward all the political issues that we were, you know, dealing with during the project. Would you say that is leaning more into the kind of idea of ritual and poetry that's embodying us uh, versus the kind of split of language right now? And leaning into that is another way of, of being recognizing one another? I, I think, well, I think that sonically, above, uh, obviously above words, it's a little harder unless you're fighting physically to be, to be distinct, to be different. Music, to get into the issue about what's important about the arts, music is a really important political phenomenon. I think visual arts has a little bit more of a struggle with how we make meaning in, in uh, political circles. But in, in this case, uh, what I was interested in was the way in which these two musical sonic um, experiences, a cappella, were both about um, spirituality, nature, the abandonment of the mills, the kind of desire for community, and all of that felt like it really came out mm -hmm. in that expression. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of you know the pandemic and what really you know was um, uh, people were seeking during that time and it's you know we're still in the pandemic but it's not only are we dealing with um, the health pandemic but you know this larger pandemic that is you know spiritual I think mm -hmm. and what you're talking about really address or your work this work I think really sounds like it's addressing that right and yeah and I think that also for you you were talking the other day about Norway 
We're both doing projects in Norway, it turns out. I'm sure they'll be very different. Yeah. Uh, but but you were talking about some kind of spirituality with respect well, warning, to nature. Yeah, and I think that also when I go off into, you know, kind of nature, I suppose you could call it wandering in nature, whatever you want to think of it, even though it's like, what is nature these days is highly questionable in, in terms of how we inhabit it as humans. But this idea of isolation for me and finding a little bit more of the, the place where I can also use that isolation to mourn, quite honestly, what is happening to our planet and needing to find that now more so than other times in my life in which that I, I need the, the kind of to place myself in more of a quiet environment to, to get a hold of all the cacophony of sounds that are happening from our world right now. What's interesting about what you're saying is this idea of isolation. I'm hearing though also the idea of you know, bringing together people um, in, en masse to have that experience as, a, as, as one modality of activism, right? I mean, that sounds like a lot of what your work is about, Suzanne. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think that the way we participate as artists in politics is also, in the way we're talking about, the way we participate as artists in life as my, my dear mentor, Alan Capro, talked about, is that we try to make meaning, we try to understand, we ask questions of the work. And I think that for me, I find that. I'm looking for the aesthetics in relationships. And, and larger scale, the larger that my scale becomes, or of necessity, is a political position. If you have... 200 teenagers sitting in cars on the top of an Oakland roof and they're just talking their hearts out about the things in their life that are failing them. It's a really poignant, affective experience as well as being, you could say, political. But it's not the politics of protest. I appreciate those politics. But, um, and I think the one person I know that kind of combines both um, of the, the politics, but also the deep compassion is Patrice Cullors. Yeah. Uh, and I hired Patrice to teach, back to students finally, to teach community organizing to my students because that's what they don't get in an art school. They, they have great compassion. They want to act. They understand critical theory, but they don't know how to build coalition. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I mean, just, I... I was quite moved by Guillermo's performance. And, you know, so much of it was, was about building that we, you know, and that is an opportunity with the arts that um, often gets lost in, you know, the art with a capital A. It's not necessarily about bringing in the most people to have the experience, um, but in order to have impact, we need to invite everyone to connect with what it is that artists connect with, that deepest part of ourselves, right? Let's hear it for Gomez Pena. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, that was, uh, that was I, I've known the Alamo since he was a baby almost, and I got to tell you, that's one of the best performances I've seen of his in a long time, and I've seen a lot of them. That was really a great performance. And, I felt myself being affectively moved mm -hmm. during it and kind of like, right, right, right on. And um, it, it was a bit boundary wandering, but it was very affective. And I think that's a quality that's not usually acceptable in art. Um, I remember Claire Bishop, well, I probably shouldn't say this in public, well, but, you can say it in public. but be, you say being things. uncomfortable with the crystal quilt which is a performance I did with 430 older women in the middle of Minneapolis on Mother's Day. And, and I thought, well, but she loved the, um, the, the piece on Code 33 with teenagers and police confronting. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. 
you know, which affect, the affect of protest, the affect of speaking out, or the affect, which there are, is affect connected with that. There's a great sense of power and pride when you go on a march or do something political. But, but I think the affect of opening up people to a different perception or to love or to the tender parts of themselves is also, can be quite political. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about this, the going back to the oversaturation and really trying to break through, like, how do you talk to your students about that? Well, I actually retired in July from teaching, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> she says, when... <laughs> so, I exhaustion. Have, I, I taught for 32 years. In those 32 years, I took one year off as a sabbatical only. And uh, I, uh, I, I, in turning 62 and losing a close colleague who was only 52 last year, I decided that it was time for the next generation as well, that none of us should hold these precious positions for a long time. If, if you don't really, you know, if, if you're questioning what it means for yourself at that point with holding space for these amazing minds, uh, they deserve absolute every 150% of you as a professor. And if your own life is going too fast for you, then I had to recalculate. So, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be going out as I was. I, I went this year and I taught at Yale and I'm going to be continuing, obviously, to a certain extent in, in, in public. But I think that one of the hardest things that the pandemic did for us as, as educators is, is uh, the relationship of, of young people not really knowing how to um, have, a, have a real dialogue that is deeper without kind of prosecution to a certain extent. And I worry about that, and I want to now use my time actually with high school students and elementary kids. I want to like do that kind of more being a part of LA as a citizen and giving my time over for those groups that are in need. That's brilliant. Versus uh, just being a college professor. And so that's where I think my time will be used now is making sure that students have great essays and understand what it looks like and also what it means to be part of, of a collective of education in sharing ideas that are not just uh, you know literally living under slogans. And I'm really concerned with what social media has done to our culture and our world and our ability for speech and the idea of democracy being of speech and if, if everybody is now going to be shut down forever, whatever different reasons, because the divides are too big, where does that really leave us in moving forward? And I'm so concerned about that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm from the working class in the San Joaquin Valley, and so I go back there all the time, and I am constantly exposed to the divide between um, the Trumpsters and- yeah, Kevin McCarthy later. The kind of, yeah. The kind and Devin Nunes, yeah. the kind of conversations that we have in our circles, and I think you might also. You came from Ohio, right? Yeah, I came from Sandusky, Ohio. Right. So, so there's a way. I came from a small town in the San Joaquin Valley, and there's a way in which I think we walk between worlds, and that for me has always been what's been interesting. I prefer to teach in situ in the process of my projects and. My projects are highly pedagogic. I, you know, for me, I learn a lot. I go in and listen and listen and understand people's conditions and circumstances and issues, what, how they want to mobilize with me. But, but in, in uh, I find higher education, particularly having taught at the Women's Building, problematic. Um, and I, I think that, that students, you know, as I said before, students learn critical theory really well. But they don't learn how to build up, you know. So I think we leave them to their own devices in grad school and say, "Hope you guys don't self-destruct," you know. <laughs> and and so I think that for me, I, I've always appreciated teaching at the lower, at the high school level, 
particularly high school. Um, but but I think that um, I think there's hope if people like you, Karen Mack, who I've invited to be part of my program at Otis, can can form more synergy with higher ed. And I've always been an advocate for bringing people that work in the community into the center of a, a higher ed process. And how does this relate to, you know, arts institute, other institutions like museums and, you know, those kinds of centers, which are also centers of learning, but also, you know, problematic in some ways, would you well, say? Well, they're, they're often problematic in relationship to patronage and what the, how much art costs. The, the, the price of art is really highly problematic. And that's why all of us who actually partake in it just make sure that we have memberships to the museums and that we're part of it. That it's like okay to send your, you know, your student membership to a museum or a fee or whatever because it's also feeding you in a certain way. And unless we turn it away from utterly focusing only on the most wealthy for patronage of the arts, we're just going to be a, a impossible position for institutions to quite honestly change. And so again, we, the people, <laughs> have, to, have to dig in and actually support our institutions as well. And I'm a philanthropist, and I love saying that as an artist. Like, I tell all my students, guess what? I'm a philanthropist too. I give at least, you know, half a million dollars or more of art away for institutions to be able to make money every year. And that is important. Like that is utterly where I can reach in and give as an artist. And so the idea of it is that we again need to allow these institutions to change, not just through critique, because critique is utterly important, but also through patronage. And those two things have to be able to go hand in hand in my mind. So how would you say, you talked about, you know, LA Commons, my organization, working with higher education. What does that look like? Well, I think in our case, I think in our case, you were, is that working? Yeah. Uh -huh. in, in our case, you were invited in to talk about community and to work with students in terms of what you did. I think we asked you to do stuff like take students throughout the communities and, and explain some things about different communities. That was part of our orientation program every year. The, when students came, grad students, we took them throughout the city with experts like yourself talking about them. But I think that, um, I think our friend Annette Kim at, at um, USC is also doing a lot to bring together diverse faculty interested in political issues with community organizations. And I myself am working right now with Allensworth State Park and the, oh, yeah. the, the people trying to put together a, 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 a kind of a sustainable farm and a, um, a historic centric, from a black point of view, mm -hmm. village in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley. So I think that a lot of us have those kinds of, I don't consider that my art, that's a citizenship practice like you're talking about. But I think that a lot of us have those kinds of interactions. I don't, I'm not addressing what you said uh, about supporting arts institution. And I say, yes, that's really, really important. But you had asked at one point earlier, what, what's changed since I became an artist? And I can tell you, the face of the artist has changed dramatically. When I went to school, there weren't even a lot of women, let alone people of color at CalArts in 1972 and three. And the idea of audience, feminists and people of color in California brought the, uh, ex exploded the idea of audience. They said, not only do we get to make art, we get to have much broader audiences. And I think that um, those, the, the other thing that has changed is the operation of the art market didn't used to be, when I went to CalArts, nobody thought about an art market. No, no. And, and you know, now when I talk to young students, I think, well, maybe you ought to learn how to paint along with your performance art. Because the, the bottom line is, they have two ways, they have multiple ways, but there are two main tracks for supporting yourself as an artist. One is to teach. And those are limited, those jobs, like Kathy said, graciously bowing out. 
Um, and then the other is, uh, you know, basically to enter the art market at the, at the current moment. So how do you deal with that? I mean, it, ha it has to transform. I mean, as from my vantage point, I mean, we started talking about, you know, humanity, like really tapping into that. And, you know, I'm, again, struggling with this definition of artists. You know, is it, everybody has the capacity for creativity. What distinguishes someone who is known as an artist from, you know, someone who's, you know, in their backyard doing... Uh, you know, making sculpture or gardening even, or, you know, other kinds of creativity. If that person in their backyard calls themselves an artist, then they have every right to call themselves an artist. Yeah. Yeah. So is the challenge... But, but I think the issue is um, one of economics. Mm -hmm. Tilly Olson wrote a, a book, I mean a, a book, but in that book is an essay on, on silences, and she talks about working class people and the fact that being a working class person makes it all that much harder to have the time mm -hmm. to commit to art. And I would say, when you ask what makes an artist, I think the willing, willingness to sacrifice pretty much almost everything. In my case, I dedicate my life to art and everything I do is oriented to that direction. And as Gomez Pena said, making it political is, um, is great, but I'd probably do it even if it wasn't political. I would devote my life to that practice. But my dad, who was a Sunday painter uh, in oils, was, you know, everything he did was creative. He thought of himself as an artist, and that was fine. He could never make a living in any way, shape, or form. So I think it goes back to this idea of how do how do people want to, how do people become artists and support themselves? I, I think that's the hardest question, and that's the question for most of my students. And that is why it is our responsibility also. I felt when I was chair of the art department at UCLA that it was my responsibility to begin to teach financial literacy to yeah. art students. Yeah. And for to put the components of professional people before them, before they're getting a degree in MFA, where they're supposed to go out and just figure out how it's all done, with only, again, kind of what you were talking about with critical theory being at the base, but how in the heck is that going to get you to get somebody to come to your studio to look at your work, really? And so I believe that uh, education and higher education needs to further look into what are the actual basis of, of being an artist and being productive and, and how you run it. I had to, you know, I graduated with my MFA from CalArts in 1988. I didn't really, I thought, I got an MFA to teach. I didn't get an MFA necessarily to think about advancing my work. That, that's what people think now when they get an MFA. But for me, it was like, well, this is my avenue to teaching because before that I was going to be a kindergarten teacher. And so then it was always clear that I was an artist. So then everybody finally said, like, you need to go to art school. You're not going to do well in the little chairs, <laughs> <laughs> which I agreed to. <laughs> but, but there is a huge component that I did not get in any of my education either. And I was art school, art school, like San Francisco Art Institute, which now is closed, which is unbelievable that that kind of institution couldn't survive in a city like San Francisco. And then CalArts. So I didn't even do where I went public universities or anything because I wasn't even able to get into them, quite honestly, with my test scores and my uh, lack of education out of high school. So art school was really kind of my only way of going to higher learning, actually, too, besides community college. And But I do think that it is a disservice to graduate people without any further information of what the business of art looks like. That is a, um, also a, um, a broader social issue, which is what Gomez Pena brought up. You know, not a lot of doctors are out of work and not a lot of lawyers or computer scientists, but a lot of artists are operating economically in a way that's a struggle. And what you, something you said earlier just struck me in terms of this economic relationship. 
you know, people don't have time for art, do people have time for democracy? <laughs> they should. <laughs> people should have time to vote, but that's getting harder and harder even as well. Right. Somebody has three jobs. How are they going to go and vote? Because they need three jobs for the cost of, of housing that is just out of control in most, in most places it's, now. Exactly. And so, yeah, that's a big question, is right. what is our relationship to all of that and being able to fulfill the needs that also fulfill the needs of a larger idea of society and being a simple society or whatever that fucking means. Sorry for saying that. <laughs> <word. laughs> and, the, and the, you know, kind of the spiritual life, I think that, I don't know if you agree with that, but I do feel like as part of being an artist is yeah. really delving into what it means to be human and uh, you know that by nature has you think about you know these structures and what your role is in you know being a part of creating a society like Omas Pena that we all want to live in. Yeah I mean that goes back to what can artists do or bring to the political sector and I think that the thing that, the couple of things that I think about when I make art is what are the questions that are foremost today? And for me, it's always, I have a long-term activist practice within gender and racial and class politics and how they operate. My education wasn't in the arts particularly, it was other things. So um, that's kind of my major focus and, and, um, and then the other thing is to create these moments where people really relate, explore what it means to be human, as you said, but also in relationship to each other. And if we were to go back to what's so disturbing now about everything from, you know, the war in Gaza, Israel, the war in Ukraine, I would say that the, the issue for me is not dissimilar to politics and the people that I came from who vote for Trump, I assume, and um, by their political, you know, um, statements. And, and the, you know, this country is living in a state of rage right now. The world is living in a state of rage. And I think that comes from, from more and more separation. And there was a guy, can I read one little quick quote quick? And then we'll go to questions right uh, after you uh, finish. Because this guy was really interesting. Um, he, is, he wrote a book, uh, two guys that I heard the other day, who wrote a book, and they were talking about the, the language, basically. They were talking about how language is essentially used in public discourse and private to create an other and to create a, a joined group. Mm -hmm. So that it really has not, no matter what you're saying, there's affective quality to the conversation that is essentially meant to divide. And I think we've gotten ourselves into a critical theory-esque conundrum, <laughs> which are people are completely critical, completely divided, and completely tribal. Right. And I think that art can bridge those yeah, divides so, in a variety of ways. That's, that's what you want to bring to the youngins, right? Yeah. Is that, that ability to transcend and connect. Um, well, we have time for some questions, and I think there might be, well, we have questions in the audience, hopefully, and also online. So, um, Bianca will lead us in that. All right, hello everyone. We're going to take questions from the audience on both sides of the stage. Lori Shori is over there to the moderator's left, and I'm Bianca over to the moderator's right. If you would like to ask a question, please come to either aisle and uh, wait by this side of the stage to ask your question. We're going to start with a question that was submitted um, through our online audience. We have an online audience watching live. That includes uh, Sheila Pinkle and Judy Baca. I'm going to start with a question from Sheila. Uh, Sheila wants to ask the panelists, is your work dependent on the museum context to be communicated? No. 
And, I can elaborate on that. And, and how so? <laughs> <laughs> no, because in terms of publication, in terms of uh, 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 community projects I've done for in federal courthouse, and you know, and also for other kind of government and uh, affiliations. I also often, different members of, of the House of Representative that I appreciate and support, I always say like, looks like a pretty tough job these days. Do you need a photograph of mine to look at? That'll help calm you down. <laughs> so uh, no, I'm not dependent on museums, but they certainly help with a wider range of audience. And I really believe them in them also to, to you know, as public institution. And I've served on museum boards here in Los Angeles. So, but I view my work in, in that I would like it to go be able beyond the museum as well, or, or beyond the gallery. And I try to do that. And I would just say that I have centered my practice very specifically within the public and political communities and I use museums as a way to um, basically solidify the ideas in art history. So museums are very different um, animals for me in terms of communication. And I just want to give a shout out to Getty because they have hired us to be a community hub as part of their upcoming PST art. So they're really trying to move the programming outside of the museum. We are specifically focused on South LA um, and to bring others into the larger conversation. Uh, we have a question here. Okay, thank you, Greg Chalette. I'll be speaking tomorrow morning. I'm Suzanne. Um, I guess the question is sort of a tough one in some ways. Having been so much part of these practices for so many years, as you know, and wondering at this point how much we, along with, say, let's say, the left, have sort of withdrawn from those bread and butter issues you guys were talking about a few minutes ago. How do the students survive? What are the sort of working class concerns? Why are so many people disaffected with the Democratic Party? And us artists struggling to sort of just hang in there. But have we sort of, sort of pulled away and ignored maybe a large constituent and left the governance wide open to what God knows what's coming next. Does that make sense? I'm not sure what the assumption is that we have uh, withdrawn. It, you mean in university? In the so, sense that we have been able to sort of construct our own little mini economies, let's say amongst artists, right? We figured out ways to get things done. This is one of the things we really teach in art school, but let's, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and that's great. But by sort of not paying attention to those larger political arenas, have we sort of allowed the power structure to sort of do what it wants? And at the moment, it looks like it's failing us. I'm talking, of course, about the Democratic Party. We're somewhere else. Well, I, I personally think we haven't withdrawn, Greg. Um, I, I think that, um, that we've, you know, that society in general is not rising up in the way that it should. Uh, or perhaps will. I think the union movement is a really good example. Uh, and, and I think that, um, I don't think it really has much to do with artists. I don't think we really have that much. We have skill sets, but we don't have that much power. I used to always say, yeah, sure, I can do you know, a performance that has 500 people in it and 2,000 people in the audience. That's not like Sylvester Stallone movies. You know, the amount of money, the amount of social... Yes, you are, Sylvester. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> you know, that amount of social capital that goes into the construction of the things you were talking about, Kathy, which is, you know, the distraction quotient is... Mm -hmm. I mean, what's happening in the media now and the separation of truth from fiction is, yeah. or the lack thereof, is massive, massive. We should all care about this. I don't think it's the Yeah, we the should all be talking artists. about it all the time, actually. And, it, and we're not enough. We're not spending enough time actually breaking things down. And that's what I was trying to do with my students towards the end. But it was, I being chair, unfortunately, you lose your undergraduate teaching. Because, so you're only do, working with the grads. And so it, that was one thing that I was really missing as well the last two years uh, at, at UCLA was... The, uh, the, I, I would try to meet with undergraduates regularly just to hear what 
they were wanting to say and making an open door policy. Or I started doing coffee with Kathy, where at eight o'clock in the morning you could come and sit in my office and I had a cappuccino machine and you could have coffee with me. And you could talk to me about anything. If you're having a personal problem, political problem, or whatever, it was just about holding space. And we're not holding enough space right now for enough voices. Here, here. Okay, over to the moderator's right. Is it working for him? Does that work? Yeah, it's weird. Well, that's okay. Hey, I'm a storyteller. I can make my voice. I am a storyteller uh, as well as an educator. And I'm a storyteller from oral to theater through all the way video and film. And I educate in all of the areas in actually uh, in grade levels from uh, elementary all the way to postgraduate. And in the present situate political situation in the world where we have major corporations <laughs> affecting political structures, national, local, state, and certainly international, uh, oil companies, excuse me, climate change, um, the real understanding of that has been, apparently has, has affected how our governments treat it. And in relation to that, I would, I'd like to make a, th there's a quote from one of the film artists of the 20th century, who I respect very highly, Luis Buñuel. The artist, he said, the artist maintains that essential margin of non-conformity so that the powerful can never affirm that everyone agrees with their actions. And we had an election this last year. Karen Bass was elected, and she was running against Rick Caruso, the yeah. most, the richest developer in uh, in Los Angeles. And the question is this. Now, Karen Bass has not been able to fully change these, the, the people who are in the city government, the mayor's office, as have council people, because housing, housing, housing. Oh, yeah. And she's, the question is this. How come we see, have, over the last 30 years since Reardon has been mayor, how come we see so many development projects, high rises in low income, long unserved, low income minority areas, uh, putting in housing projects on the basis of this will be affordable. And yet, uh, in many of those areas, people feel that it is actually force be in, when these things are done, it is gentrification. It is driving those long-standing communities out of Los Angeles. And uh, I and how can and I, having viewed this in in a city which has created a freeway system that has. Uh, made segregation matter of distance over the years, over the history of Los Angeles. Why, how is it that those housing projects are still going on? Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. What well, fortunately, there are artists, activists in relationship to housing in LA. And uh, 34th Street in Lincoln Heights is really important uh, group of Two artists, Michael Hayden and, and Anthony Lepore, uh, who realized that this high rise was going in that was on one of the most polluted sites ever in the history of LA. And they have worked with government and with the EPA and with Washington to the housing, it's going to get built, but they were able to mitigate the toxicity by making basically forcing legally for the developer to take responsibility 
for the other people within the community. So by all means, there are artists activists in relationship to housing in LA. And yeah, I've lived here for a very long time and it's, we're not done. And uh, we all need to actually think about what our own needs of housing are from a personal standpoint, you know? Yeah, and I think that just to go way back in history, Alan Sakula did a big project on the development of Bunker Hill. Yeah. And uh, that's more in the line, less of, quote, activism and more in the line of analysis and kind of trying to provide deeper understandings. But I have students also that have gone into the housing movement here and think it's a natural thing given the amount of the cost of living in this city. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're on to our next question from the audience. Hi, thanks um, so much for this being part of this afternoon. And part of what this whole discussion was about, talking about the role of art and sustaining and even strengthening democracy when it feels like everything is going up in flames. And y'all talking about this contradiction of, holy crap, you know, there's, it feels like the whole world is on our doorstep every single day and how heavy that is. And, and what we have to speak to as an artist, what's going to drive us? Is it going to be, what's, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic and I just appreciate the, the space here. And, you know, and it says this thing around democracy, strengthening democracy, but then the question here is like getting into <laughs> what the role of the artist and even pushing these boundaries of what is the conversation going to be happening? And even this question of democracy, you know, we say democracy is just another form of dictatorship, you know, and so what kind of dictatorship, what kind of democracy? And so I just wanted to ask you to respond to a society that in, encourages and enables people to fully speak their minds politically and express themselves freely through art and other means to dissent with protest giving constitutional backing, a whole different society not based on capitalism and all this terror. So I'm just wondering what that provokes in your thinking. Is that a role of artists to like be pushing those boundaries, being bringing that from the outside to your students and to society? Thank you. I think I, I'm um, actually, unlike Gomez Pena, I have not given up on government. And what I try to do is, I had a class in pedagogy and I tried to situate Frarian and other kinds of radical pedagogy ideas within the context of, of politics. Because politics is, is deeply um, affecting education right now. And so I think that um, artists and educators play a role in, in basically pushing the ideas, opening the ideas, and, but I think that within what you said, there's this idea that it's a franticness, that it's all going to happen now, the urgency that I think people feel around, for example, Gaza and Israel, and they did feel around Ukraine. I think that urgency pushes us to try to make quick solutions, radical, you know, radical moves. And I, I think that one thing I would urge you is that this has been going on for a really, really, really long time, this so-called takeover of post-capitalism. And um, it's a long life. Just yeah. preserve your energy to keep doing it. I guess that's what I would say. I think that's so good. I mean, that, that is, you know, uh, that is, I think, really important. And I think that more importantly is, is also, I, I, in being a teacher and also a parent, and I, I have a grandson who's 10 and I have a son who's 21 and a daughter who's 43, and the relationship of how I discuss ideas around democracy and, and what your responsibility is uh, to them is the same that I would say to my students or anybody else, that uh, to completely forego the notion of government always failing us means that you're going to also participate potentially if you choose not to vote in laws going further down a rabbit hole that's going to cause continuous harm even though an enormous amount of harm is done already and that within longevity it is about the preservation of yourself and by no means as I said at the beginning of this 
does every artist have to be an activist? It has to be the relationship to your idea of your own personal goals in life and what you want to do with community and the collectivity of your own position of your ideas. And that is first and foremost, and then it builds. It builds like a city builds. It builds in all these ways that, you know, we no, we, I've known you since the 80s, and what is the relationship of holding this place and these ideas? And even though we're out in the world doing our separate things all the time and we barely see each other, but we can come together and that still builds an idea of collectivity and conversation. And so preserve yourself, I agree with that, and allow your own integrity to also lead what is important to you in your life. And that's what I want to say to young people, basically. Okay, we just have time for one last question here. And here you go. Mr. Watt, uh, quick questions related. Would you agree that artists from certain parts of the world are intrinsically activists? Their entry into Western art traditions is primarily founded on the fact that they bring their politics with them. My first question. Uh, my related question to that is, You've heard, obviously, that many curators, documentary curators resigned, the art form editor was fired, and so on and so forth. I think, would you feel comfortable taking positions on those, on those two resignations and hundreds of others? And certainly they're academics too, I'm an academic. And certain positions, certain calling what performative speech acts, what have you, are absolutely policed. There's no question about it. You lose bread and butter issues. Why hasn't the art world, the academic art world, taking a stronger position on this ideological war that's actually happening. And, yeah. Hmm. Well, it's two, two points. Mm -hmm. The first, the, I, I got the second point, but the, what was the first? That's oh, yeah, yeah, never mind, never mind. So uh, do people from other non-Western societies enter necessarily with politics? I think everybody enters necessarily with politics. I'm not sure how how much people are aware of that, but uh, like like I, the the book I was quoting, the politics of language, the the fact is we bring a set of values and perspectives and sort of nuanced relationship with the world to every single conversation. So uh, I know plenty of artists in other parts of the world that don't look like they're political, um, and some of us are more happy to embrace it, but, um, but I don't think that, that it is particular to artists of color and artists from other parts of the world. I'm thinking yeah. about the question. It's a very interesting question. And, and, it's, you know, and it makes me think a lot about kind of the future a little bit. Like I'm thinking about AI and singularity. This, the, these other larger ideas of what then begins to, to uh, uh, distill uh, even farther down uh, relationship to individual opinion. And so I, I wanna really talk about the individual re in, in terms of the collective and the importance of that. And, and it, it goes back to the same answer that I've been saying all day actually, or during this panel, which is it's that individual's right and choice to begin to determine uh, outside of themselves and even outside of the critic, what their position is. And so I think that that ultimately is so important because, I mean, would you say, you know, uh, every artist from China is an activist? Not necessarily. So you're already making these huge, giant, sweeping definitions that are part of the problem. And uh, that's, that's why I just go back to the individual, I suppose. And just to go back quickly, I mean, I bring my identity as a woman and as a working class person into everything I do. So I think that we, we come with identities and we come with the politics of necessity based on those identities. And in terms of the, the I'm not sh sure exactly what you were talking about in terms of the current divisive nature of art world discourse, but I can just tell you that I think that the allowed public 
vehicle for discourse is not uh, conducive to real negotiation and understanding. And on that note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we thank, uh, this conversation was as rich and insightful as I anticipated, so can we just thank our wonderful artists for... Um, so you'll be able to find a summary of our conversation at ZocaloPublicSquare.org by tomorrow, plus interviews with all our panelists and many more conversations and essays. The conference continues until 445. In the meantime, please join us for an intermission to continue the conversation. We have to clear the auditorium, so make your way to the lobby for coffee and tea. Folks that have checked in for the full day and received their orange wristband but changed their mind and don't want to stay for part two, please return it to the box office to make space for other people to join. Thank you. Thank you.